as much as you can up front. Um, really, really do your due diligence on every aspect. Uh, try to think of what can go wrong and have a plan B. As an operator, I know other investors are romanticizing multifamily investing, and I'm looking to learn from other investors' mistakes. I know you are too, and you found the right place. Welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Hey everybody and welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. I'm your host Jerome and I've got the pleasure of having Georgia Brew with me today. How are you down in Texas, man? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good here in Texas. How you doing? Amazing. Thanks for asking. Before we jump in, do me a favor and let the listeners know how they can get in contact with you if they like what they hear. They can go to, uh, easiest way is to go to my website, Elevate CIG, Commercial Investment Group is what it stands for. So elevatecig.com. They can also shoot me an email at George or Jorge, it's spelled J-O-R-G-E at elevatecig.com. Awesome. So now let's dive into the background, man. How did you get into multifamily and what have you been working on most recently? Okay. So how I got into multifamily, um, I, I got into real estate investing, uh, probably about 14 years now and started with single family at first did uh, quite a bit of fix and flips wholesaling did some some rentals um, also did some smaller multifamily like uh, we had a couple fourplexes an eightplex um, and then maybe about three and a half to four years ago um, I woke up one day and I kind of just looked back at what I had done and what I had built. And I realized to that point, it was very transactional. Um, I had also built a, a construction company, which I chose to do to help me scale the fix to flip, fix and flip some single family. But, you know, other than that, you know, the, the real estate side of it stayed pretty transactional. Um, and I realized that I wanted to, build more wealth, build more um, cash flow coming in on that side. And that's when I started looking more into multifamily, uh, ended up getting a coach and then uh, tried doing single family and multifamily at the same time for, for a little bit. And then I realized that uh, I wanted to focus on multifamily and I sold off what I had for, for single family and went all in on the multi. So was this all in Texas, like in your backyard, or were you doing stuff out of state? Like, how'd you get into the game? Yeah, I mean, it started it started in Texas and in Dallas is when I started underwriting deals, um, when I was just learning how to underwrite them. And um, I think it feels more comfortable for everybody to stay you know, close by, at least at first. Um, and I, I quickly realized that None of the deals were penciling out. Dallas is a super hot market. Um, and I wasn't willing to pay. I don't know if it's my single family back background or what. I just, I wasn't really willing to pay retail for some of these deals or even above retail is what I felt like was happening. Um, so that's when I started going a little further out and started looking at some secondary markets in Texas and then um, landed a couple there and ended up looking into Oklahoma as well, landed some there. And, um, so yeah, I really, I, I then came back and finally got one in the, in Dallas, Fort Worth. But, um, if I hadn't done that, I mean, I would have kept struggling. So I think it was pretty crucial to, to look outside of my own market. Got it. And so through all those deals, they all went perfect and you've made a fortune on everyone you've done, right? <laughs> Yeah, man, it's been so easy. Just sit back and relax. Yeah. Once you went through the mentorship program, you didn't have to do anything. Right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Not, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of obstacles, a lot of hurdles, you know, a lot of stuff that um, you usually don't hear in these type of uh, podcasts. And yeah. So 
let's talk about some of the challenges along the way. Like what, what's been some of the stuff that, you know, people don't typically hear about that you've experienced. Cause I saw a lot of press. You guys did like 800 unit deal last year, if I'm not mistaken. So you've been crushing it, but I know that there's, it's not all rainbows and cherries. Yeah. If you want, we can start with that one. So that one had a unique, uh, I mean, the deal itself was was a roller coaster from beginning to end um, to get it to to close. Um, I think a uh, lot of a lot of obstacles came up. Um, the biggest one was a few. No, okay, sorry. There was two big ones. <laughs> one was uh, we had a, a prep equity partner, and they had committed. They had given us a formal term sheet, they were all in. And then I want to say it was maybe a month, maybe a month and a half before we were set to close. Um, they just dropped out. We said, you know what, we're out. We got another deal that we want to, I don't know, I, I don't even remember the, the excuse, but they weren't tied into the deal, at least not financially. So yeah, they, they took off. So we were, that was a $10 million check. So <laughs> we're about a month out of closing and short 10 million. So um, luckily we, we had a couple backups. They weren't, uh, they hadn't committed like a hundred percent, but we knew they were interested. So, I mean, for the next week or two, I mean, we were grinding it out, man. Our whole team was just you know, trying to figure it out and, and get it done. Luckily we did. We got somebody else to to sign up and uh, to commit to the deal. And um, at that point, we thought we were good. <laughs> Everything was all good. And then uh, this was, I want to say like a week before we closed, or maybe even a couple of days, the lender's attorney and our prep equity partner's attorney were not coming eye to eye on some of the paperwork and the way the agreements read. Um, pretty much they didn't want the, the, the prep equity can't look like a second lien on the property. You know, it can't be written that way. And some of the terms kind of, um, alluded to that. So the attorneys were battling it out. And I think it was the day before closing, they finally agreed and, um, we closed, <laughs> but I mean, Pretty stressful. I had a full set of hair before. No. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, I mean, that's some of the stuff you don't, you don't really hear about. Um, uh, but it, it happens. So if you can talk about it, I don't know if you can. What was so challenging about the terms that you had to there was arguments about whether or not, I guess it was legal or if you could actually do the equity thing, right? Yeah, I think the, the clause where the prep equity partner can step in if, if certain numbers are not hit is um, where the issue was. And the, our, our lender, not the preferred equity, but our, our actual lender didn't like the way it was worded and, and wanted to make sure pretty much that if we're, if we're not making our payments or, or there's an issue that the lender can, you know, do what they need to do and not have, and deal with us and not have to deal with somebody else. Um, so I don't remember the exact specifics. I wasn't the main one dealing with it, but something like that, if that makes sense. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to deal with that one either. So they pull out somebody, well, first somebody pulled out before that, 10 million. You brought other people in. You got a deep network, man. I don't know many people that can raise 10 million for a deal. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've... Uh, We've been going hard at looking for those uh, institutional, whatever you want to call them, you know, someone that can write a check that big. So 
is this like family office or is it more like like a hedge fund or private act? like how do you get it's not this person writing a check right no no not this one um this one was just it was just a fund a private private equity for uh fund and so I, i'm always curious about these so had you what did you do in order to position yourself to be ready to talk to somebody about writing a single check that day because they are really stringent and really particular yeah yeah no you're absolutely right man it, it's it's all about track record i mean you, you've got to have a strong track record you've got to um go full cycle on on several deals and 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 prove the returns that you were able to produce on those and deliver. Um, so elevate alone, you know, my, my team alone, we wouldn't be able to do it. So we had a co GP on that deal that had an extensive track record. Um, and they were backing us up, you know, that's the track record we were using. So without that, forget it. They wouldn't even, listen to us. <laughs> okay, so you partnered on the deal, co-GP, and then the combination of you guys went to private equity to bring the big check and to do this Got it. deal. What was, well, I guess you don't want to tell that. Maybe you do. Is it in Texas or Oklahoma? The property or the, the firm? Property. Properties in, in Texas, yeah. Okay. I know you guys don't have to disclose buy price, so I won't ask you what the buy was. <laughs> no, not in Texas, man. <laughs> Taxes. <are. laughs> okay. And so you, you had your co-GP, you guys got through the deal, finally got that one closed. Is that the only time that you had issues with closing the deal? No, before that we had a, so the ones I'm thinking about are, you know, something that, that you can learn from. So what we learned from this last one with the, with prep equity was um, certain things that we do differently moving forward is one, we, we'll, we try to have several backups and like have them ready to go. Um, and two is try to push them to actually put money into the deal, you know, financially, some of the deposit or some of the, um, third party fees. So they're a little more committed, easier said than done, but everything is negotiable. Um, so we, we try to go that route to avoid this happening again. Um, people want to be profitable multifamily operators, but lack the knowledge, deal flow experience and capital to be successful. They often try to overcome these challenges out of order, slowing or eliminating their ability to get their next deal done. We've developed a framework that allows them to gain the knowledge they need to find profitable deals. When they do, they create the time and location freedom, as well as the generational wealth they desire for their family. The Myers methods of multifamily investing have proved to be the fastest way to establish credibility and properly grow an apartment portfolio. If you want to know more about our four-step process, jump over to MyersMethods.com to get our free four-step guide to getting into multifamily investing. Let's get back to the episode. When they do that, I assume that you've been able to successfully get people into the deal early on. Are they doing it based on their amount of ownership in the deal? Or are you trying to get them to fund all the due diligence to make sure that they're totally committed? Because I went down this path and I knew that they weren't really going to fund when they wouldn't put any money in. So how do you get them across the line? Um, I mean, ideally, it would, it would be nice uh, percentage-wise. Uh, you know, honestly, anything's better than nothing. So if I, you know, let's say we got 500000 into the deal. If I can get them to put 100000 of that, I feel a little more comfortable. Um, but at the same time, most of these firms are going to actually ask you for money when, <laughs> when, uh, when it's time to uh, sign their term sheet or, or move forward so there's a lot of uh a lot of negotiating at that point you've really got to be able to sell your deal and and show them you know why it's such a good deal and hey if 
you don't want to do this and you don't feel comfortable doing this, that's fine. You know, I'll call so-and-so and, and they're ready to go. Um, if you don't want to provide these returns to your investors, hey, that's it's okay. But Take it or leave it, guys. Yeah, okay. you got to find that middle ground, though. You know, at the same time, you're like, please, please, please. <laughs> 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 okay, so you get them in the deal, make sure you got a backup plan. Just out of curiosity, were the terms with the new group better than the terms with the first group that walked away? Yes. I do want to say yes. A little bit. but Yeah. I mean, every piece counts that deal yes. that size, right? Most definitely. Um, so as far as another situation, um, similar in the fact that we were almost set to close. And um, this was a little earlier on. Was... We were, I want to say, a few weeks out from closing. And for some reason, this will never happen again, but we hadn't finalized our insurance yet, you know. Um, <laughs> and when we, once, when we went to go do that, the insurance was coming back, I want to say, double what we had in our performa. Um, and it was because there was a ton of... Um, losses from the seller in the past two or three years um there was a couple fires and then i think uh water loss and a bunch of stuff point is at the same time it was also um this is in oklahoma and it was a tor tornado alley kind of area so um the insurance was just coming back at a crazy crazy number and it was really throwing off our projections and our returns. Um, so we kind of panicked. Um, and I think we reached out to every single insurance <laughs> agent out there. Um, we realized that the insurance market is a weird, weird place, man. Like you, I don't know if you know this, but like you, you can't really have, um, it's hard to have competition. Like you, if you have one insurance agent and another insurance agent trying to get you insurance, they're both going to send it to the same, um, carriers or whatever you call it. Yeah. And then one's going to tell you, well, we already got this from somebody. And then they're going to come back to you and tell you, Oh, you've got another agent working on this. And so point is, <laughs> After contacting all these agents, um, we found somebody that was very creative and was able to figure out a way to structure it differently. Not to, not to necessarily go to a different um, insurance company, but just the way the insurance was structured. And he brought it back down to what we had originally projected and we closed again. But uh, we did realize and learn to get your insurance up front. Like, as soon as you can, get the insurance figured out. Right, and so from a valuation perspective, if you're okay with sharing, how much of a difference in value would the higher price have impacted the property? I wanna say, let's see if this makes sense. Yeah, it's about a two hundred thousand dollar value. Wow! And this was a deal we were structuring um, a little different than than your usual syndication, where um, we try to return all the capital back to the in investors on the refi. So that two hundred thousand dollars is very crucial. You know, we want to make sure we're we're getting that value. Um, so that we can get all the capital back to the investors on the refi. So yeah, man, it almost killed the deal. Um, we we were close to walking from it. Um, actually, the seller ended up helping a little bit too on the price. We got the price discounted because he hadn't disclosed um, all the claims that he had on the property. And yeah. So did you ask for the loss runs during due diligence and he didn't send them? He did, but I think he, he either missed a couple or missed 
something like that. Um, but I'm pretty sure this was after due diligence and he still agreed to, to discount the price. So, um, yeah. Did he miss or did he? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. We might have missed it. Like I said, it was already on. <laughs> but uh, So people always kind of look at me crazy when I send in the request and say, hey, we want your loss runs for the last five years. They're like, what do you want that for? Because of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, now we sure do, man. Now we got our checklist and we got our, <laughs> yeah, we, we get everything. Yeah, I mean, 200 grand is kind of a big deal. How many doors was this one? Uh, 216. Oh, well. So it's not, I mean, you know, still. I mean, it makes a difference. I may be off on that. I, I did a $70,000. It might have been more than that. Um, yeah, I just, I can't remember. No, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it's a couple. I know of- it was enough to make a difference. I know when we re-ran the projections, it was making a difference and... We panicked a little bit. So were there any other changes to the due diligence process outside of that? Are there other numbers that you're getting quotes for earlier in the process too? Uh, Taxes, man. Taxes uh, in Texas have been crazy, especially the past few years. Um, So we usually get a, we we work closely with the tax protest company and and we get them to look at it and see what they think. they can protest the taxes and, and, and get even with the new um, purchase price. And um, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the taxes, insurance, those two for sure. Um, you know, I think payroll and, and anything to do with property management is important to have. Um, not just use the rule of thumb, but have the property management company you're going to use to actually look at it. And, and tell you what they think. Okay. And so what you guys pro forma and does the property management company give you numbers for insurance too, or is that something that you keep totally outside of them? Keep it outside. Okay. We do, but I know some people rely on the property management company to do everything, mortgage, insurance, taxes, everything. Nah, man, I think, the, the more you let them focus on the property management, the better. Um, yeah. They, they start getting confused and thinking it's their property. So I get it. I mean, we don't even let them handle the CapEx. You know, we obviously I use my construction company to come in and, and do the CapEx part of it. We want them solely focusing on property management. So, so that part is super interesting for me, and I know we didn't sign up to talk about that, but I'm really curious. So, my property management company is able to do the capex for very similar numbers to what we could do with my con my contracting company, and so how much are you able to save, or is it really just being able to control the schedule? by actually executing the construction management in-house? Um, I know we're saving some, but yeah, you're right. It's not like it's an insane amount of money that we're saving more. It's more the fact that the scheduling, the process, the who's actually doing, you know, who the crews are and, and who's doing the work. Um, uh, just to trust that it's going to get done correctly gonna you know we're not gonna have any issues um and uh, the management part of it you know i've got my project managers that go through extensive training that i 100 percent trust versus property managements i mean i don't know man i think some of them even use the same like regional or uh, district manager whatever you want to call them to to look over the capex as well um I just, I, I don't know how much construction experience some of them really have. Very little. The maintenance supervisors run it at all, baby. Yeah, exactly. Cruise. <laughs> Probably not the most efficient way to do it for sure. So final question is what words of wisdom do you have for the listeners? Words of wisdom, man. Uh, you know, try to do 
as much as you can up front. Um, really, really do your due diligence on every aspect. Uh, try to think of what can go wrong and have a plan B and C lined up. And, um, you know, when something, when you do run into an obstacle, just be ready to to tackle it and, and go after it. Like, don't, don't feel defeated and um, don't get in your head, you know, like you, you've got to be positive and, and um, to get over some of this stuff. How dare you say that something's going to go wrong? Everything goes <laughs> and it's on time, under budget, and everything Good. gets rich every single time. Of course, man, of course. <laughs> George, I appreciate you sharing with our listeners. I, I found this really valuable. I haven't talked to anybody so far about lost runs and how that can increase your insurance. And, you know, the other question mark for a lot of people is taxes and what that ends up being, because some people reassess on the trade. Others are on this cycle and you don't really know how much it's going to increase when they reassess. So especially when you're buying something that's been renovated and repositioned or you're repositioning it and you're actually pulling permits to tell the city that you're right. repositioning it because that makes a huge difference in valuation. So definitely appreciate you sharing that and I wish you more continued success. You guys are making waves and I, I really like what I see through social media and it was great seeing you at Apartment Investing Secrets. So I look forward mm-hmm. to continuing to build a relationship and we'll get to talk soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You made it to this juncture. So you really love what we shared on this episode of Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Do us a favor. Give us a five-star rating. Give us a review and share this with somebody who's interested in multifamily investing. Until the next time, the pack is with you.